thank you very much. Uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so yes, uh, I feel like I should probably, uh, I mean, I have a standard introduction that I always give, so you may have heard some of this already, but my, uh, my, my favorite way to describe myself is to say that I am a mathematician. Uh, and I know some people feel that that term should be reserved for someone who is actively researching in maths, but I feel like it's helpful to tell people that I am a mathematician because I studied maths at school and I studied maths at university. And at the end of university, I still hadn't had enough maths. Uh, so I did some research into maths. And now all I really do is talk about maths in lots of different places. Um, so hopefully that explains why I'm here talking about maths. Uh, and I've brought along some maths, which I think will hopefully give you a bit of an insight into uh, and certainly from my perspective, at least, what it means to be a mathematician. Uh, so the title of my talk is Maths' Greatest Unsolved Puzzles. And there are a few reasons why I've called it this. So I feel like uh, I'm a mathematician. A lot of my friends are also mathematicians. And one thing that we all seem to have in common is that we're all really interested in puzzles. We all like solving puzzles. Uh, we like writing our own puzzles. We like doing crosswords. We like entering international comp uh, puzzle competitions and coming 11th. Uh, and it is a huge hobby. It's something that we're all really into. And I don't think it's a coincidence that people who like maths also enjoy solving puzzles because there's something really kind of common about the, the features of these two things. So, you know, you might find uh, that you get stuck on something and you're not really sure what to do next. And you can maybe try and look at it from a different angle or break it down into smaller problems or uh, use some kind of information or idea or thing that you already know and try and apply that to it. Um, and there's also that that moment of excitement and joy when you discover the answer and you know that you've definitely got the right answer. Uh, and you get that with solving puzzles and you also get it with uh, doing mathematics. So uh, in this, what I'm going to try and do is to tell you about some of the puzzles which we don't know the answers to yet. There are unsolved puzzles there in mathematics. And I guess if you study maths at school, it's quite easy to get the impression that we've kind of finished. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that you study were discovered hundreds of years ago. Uh, and you're kind of thinking, well, what are mathematicians doing now? Because none of the things you learn at school were even discovered in the last 10 or 15 years. So what's actually happening in research departments? What are mathematicians doing? Are they just counting higher and higher to see what happens? Um, I'm going to try and give, it's not that, if you're wondering. I'm going to try and give you a bit of an idea of how some of that works. Um, and I'm also going to give you some puzzles to do, because why not? Because I enjoy them, and I think you should probably enjoy them as well. Uh, so there will be chances for you to have a go at some puzzles in amongst all of this. Uh, and in that vein, I'm going to start off with uh, a nice little puzzle. Uh, for this one, um, I think I might just ask for hands up if you've got an answer to this, and we'll see who can get there first. So I'm, I'm not sure if I can quite see everyone in the balconies, but hopefully I can see most people in the room. Uh, so I'll put the puzzle up on the screen. It says, which of these numbers is the sum of two of the other numbers? Now, if you're confused by this, there aren't any numbers yet. They will appear shortly, <laughs> uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, but when they do appear, there may or may not be a number there which you can write as a sum of two of the other numbers that are present on the screen. So I'm going to put the numbers up. If I can get a hand up from someone, if you spot the answer to this. Here we go. Oh, we've got a hand up on the back row. 15, yeah, fantastic. So 15 is there, and you can write that as a sum of uh, 4 and 11, yeah? So uh, that's a, a nice little warm-up. Hopefully, you've all just spent a couple of minutes just frantically adding numbers together in your head. That was my goal. Uh, but <laughs> now that you've got your maths brain switched on a little bit, um, I thought I'd, I'd like this puzzle, in fact. This is a nice, uh, a nice one for me, I think, because uh, this is an example of something which people are, in some sense, better at than computers. Because um, I guess as a, as a human looking at this, there are various kind of judgments you can make and say, well, I'm not going to try adding 65 to anything. That's not going to get me anywhere. You can kind of reasonably um, sort of rule out various possibilities immediately. Uh, and a computer solving this, if it just has a very naive strategy, would just take every single pair of numbers and add them together and compare the answer to the whole list. So as the number of numbers gets bigger, this becomes a much bigger problem because the number of pairs of numbers gets bigger much more quickly. Um, so if you take nothing else away from this evening, just know that you're slightly better than computers at a very small, limited subset of things. Um, so <laughs> that's my kind of warm-up puzzle. Um, and I think I've got a secondary puzzle, which I'm going to give to you now. And I might give you a minute to think about this one to see if you can get an answer to this. Um, so this is a question which you've got half of on the screen. And I'm going to give you the second half in a second. Uh, so which number? between 10 and 20, there's a clue there that there is one, uh, there is one number between 10 and 20 which can't be written 
as a sum of two or more consecutive whole numbers. So consecutive numbers like one, two, three, four, five, um, but you need at least two of them in there because otherwise they're not consecutive. Uh, and there are numbers between 10 and 20. There are ways to write them as a sum. And there is one number in there that can't be done. So have a minute and think about that. Okay, I think I can see a hand up. Um, it's great that the one time I'm being filmed, I drop a thing on stage, isn't it? That's just great for me. Uh, yes. 18. So 18 is, I think 18 is possible. Can anyone immediately say how to do 18? 3, 4, 5, 6. 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, so 18 can be done. Was there a hand up slightly further back? Did you also have 18? OK. Anyone got a different answer? Yeah? 16. Yeah, so 16 can't be done. Uh, and in fact, there's a much more general pattern uh, here, which is that the numbers that can't be done all follow a very specific, interesting pattern. And I'll leave that with you, because that's a nice one to work on later on. Um, but you can also prove that this will always work, and this will always only work for, for certain numbers and not work for other numbers. Uh, but I'm going to leave you with that one. So I guess the thing to think about here is that you're, you're, kind of, you're solving puzzles. Um, but the way that mathematics works is, I guess there are a few different kinds of maths that you can do. And there are some people who research in maths because they have specific problems to solve. So people who do applied maths might have a particular real world problem that someone has given them that they need to uh, find an answer to. You know, how can we make this work? How can we do this thing? Um, there are some people who use mathematics to, to sort of attack problems in statistics or in, uh, I'm sure you'll hear about that later, uh, but you know, in, in you know, different areas, operational research and, and kind of different types of applied maths. Um, but there's also pure mathematics, and that's the area that I did research in. And I think, uh, for me, one thing that's nice about mathematics, and pure mathematics in particular, is that it's quite a creative subject. And a lot of people don't realize this. So what you will essentially do if you're working in pure maths is you will have an idea. So you'll maybe see a pattern in something, or you'll see a connection between two things, and you think, I wonder if that pattern carries on forever, or I wonder if that connection is related to this other thing, or if you know, there is something interesting happening here. Once you've got an idea, your job as a mathematician is then to prove that you are correct. And if you can prove that your idea is correct uh, and that you've not made a mistake, then you end up with a theorem. You end up with a mathematical theorem. Uh, and theorem, I guess, is a word which isn't really used much outside of mathematics. It's something that only mathematicians really say. Uh, but it is a fact. It's a thing that is proved. And once you've proved something, it is in the toolbox. Mathematicians can use it. Other mathematicians can take your piece of maths and use it to do other things with. Um, just out of interest, I'm going to see if I can get a show of hands here. Can anyone name a theorem? I want to see how many theorems we can name in this room. So there's a hand right at the back, just behind the glass. Pythagoras' theorem, very famous example of a theorem. It's almost always the first answer I get to this question, so good, good answer. Someone's got to say it. Uh, yes, at the front. Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem, excellent example of a theorem. Um, yes? Fermat's little theorem. Fermat's little theorem. It's, it's smaller than Fermat's last theorem, but it's still pretty good. Uh, on the side, yep. Yeah. Bayes theorem. Nice, nice bit of stats, I like it. Uh, anything else? Oh, right at the back. Binomial theorem, excellent, excellent. This is a brilliant audience for this. Sometimes you just get Pythagoras and then nothing. Um, <laughs> yes, same person again. Sorry? De Morgan's, yeah, De Morgan's theorem. So there are hundreds, thousands of mathematical theorems out there. Some are more famous than others. Um, and there are even things that you don't necessarily think of as being a theorem. So things like um, uh, the, the cosine rule or the quadratic formula, uh, even though it doesn't have somebody's theorem or the something theorem uh, in its name, uh, it will be something that someone somewhere has proved. They've put the work in, they've proved this piece of maths, and it has gone into our toolbox of mathematical ideas that anyone can now use. Essentially, what I'm saying is mathematicians are really lazy, uh, and they don't like to do work that they don't have to do. So if someone has proved something, and everyone is happy with that proof, then you can just use it. You can just pick that up and use it, whatever you want to do. So I'm going to give you a chance to prove something now. This is your, uh, your first proper puzzle. And uh, I'm going to put it up on the screen, and you will have a minute to think about this one. And the puzzle in this case is, I guess, to decide whether or not you think the task I'm giving you is possible. So there's going to be a diagram on the screen. Your challenge is to color in the diagram. And there are two rules. So you're only allowed to use three different colors. And I love that some people are getting pencil cases out. You, you won't need a pen or pencil. You can do this in your mind. Uh, or you can if you want. Uh, so you've only allowed three different colors. And wherever there are two sections of the diagram that touch, that share an edge, 
they have to be different colors either side of the line. So you can't have two regions the same color that connect by an edge. So uh, three colors, no connected regions the same color. And I want you to decide, first of all, whether you think this is possible. If you think it is possible, prove it, color it in, show me a way to do it. And if you think it's not possible, I want you to prove that. And I want you to convince yourself and the people around you, this may involve some limited conversation, uh, but convince the people around you that it is not possible. And if you can do that inside of a minute, uh, then hopefully you'll, you'll come to a decision one way or the other and convince yourself that you are correct. So I'm going to put the diagram up and you'll have one minute to think about it. Here we go. So there is your diagram. One minute, have a go. Okay. Okay, I'm taking away the maths. Stop doing maths. Good. Uh, so uh, you've had a minute to think about this. I'm hoping you've come to a decision one way or the other. Uh, but I'm going to, first of all, before I come back to this, I'm going to explain to you why uh, you're in a maths lecture and you're coloring in. Because uh, that might not feel quite like uh, maths. Uh, in fact, it may feel um, you know, more like possibly geography. Uh, if you had to pick a school subject. And geography is, and I'm going to clarify, a very worthwhile and valid subject. However, this is actually geography, uh, it turns out. So the original piece of maths that this is based on was uh, a problem that originated with some map makers in around about 1852. And they were trying to make a map of the counties of England, and they were going to print hundreds of these and sell them. And they wanted to colour in the map so that any two counties with a, with a shared border would be different colours, which is a completely reasonable thing to want to do. But they found that if they had three different colours of ink, they couldn't do it. No matter where they started colouring from, no matter what they did, they could not fit the three colours into this map and not have two regions uh, the same colour next to each other. So they said, OK, well, we'll send someone down to the shop, get a fourth colour of ink, bring it back, print all the maps, it'll be fine. Uh, and they checked, and with four colours, it is possible. But they said, well, hang on, before you go down to the shop, what if you know, next week we do Wales or France or something and we need five colours? Then we'll have to go all the way back down to the ink shop. So uh, we should probably check. And what if, what if we try and do another country and it, it needs 10 colours? Or what if it's possible to construct a map so complicated we need 100 different colours and this is going to get ridiculous? So the question was then, how many colours do you need? Is there a maximum number of colours you might need to colour in a map like this? And if so, what is it? And it was 1852 that they asked this question, and it became a maths problem. So mathematicians worked on this problem. Um, and in around about 1890, someone came forward and said, I have a solution. I've got the answer. It's definitely this, and I've definitely proved it. And someone else said, there is an error in your maths. And they said, oh, um, I'm pretty sure that's exactly how it went. So people carried on working. And in, it wasn't until 1970 or 19, early 1970s that we actually got the answer to this problem. Um, so there's a few things to bear in mind here. So first of all, there are things which can be colored in with three colors. So here is a map of the counties of Australia. If I wanted to color this in with three colors, it is possible to do this. And in fact, if I wanted to prove to you that it is possible to color this in with three colors, I simply just have to do it. I have to color it in with three colors. And if I can do that, that is in a sufficient proof that it is possible to do something. And proving something is possible uh, is as simple as either just doing the thing or giving a description of how you might do it or a method for doing it. Um, so proving something is possible is, is one thing. But proving something is not possible is slightly more difficult. And I'm hoping you've come to the conclusion that this one is not possible with three colors. Um, but in fact, it's slightly difficult to prove this because if you say, well, I did this, and then I did this, uh, and then I got stuck and I couldn't go any further, that doesn't prove that it's not possible. It proves that you can't do it. Uh, but you know, you've, there's a bit of a distinction you have to make there. And you have to be sure that everything you're saying is definitely always going to be true or definitely uh, forced, that you are somehow required to do the things that you're doing. So for example, in this case, and I think this is probably a line of reasoning that quite a lot of people tend to follow, 
Um, if I'm going to colour in this whole diagram, I will have to colour in the middle bit at some point, somewhere along the line. I definitely need to colour that in. And I'm going to pick a colour now. Uh, I'm going to pick the colour yellow, and I'm going to colour that in. But of course, I haven't really made a choice there, because if I'd picked a different colour, I would have just used the other two colours in place of whatever else I was using. So I sort of have made a decision, which might have been a wrong decision. But in this case, it doesn't matter, because whatever I chose, everything else will also just change to fit around it. So uh, yellow in the middle. There is now only one way to colour the next kind of ring uh, of pieces. And some people look at that and think, oh, well, there's four, and there's four touching it. We're only allowed three different colours, so you can't do that. But you can. There is a way. And all you need to do is alternate colours around the circle. So blue, red, blue, red, uh, and you can colour this in. And of course, if I'd started with red in the middle, it would be blue, yellow, blue, yellow, and so on. Um, so this is fine. This is possible. But now... I start to get a bit stuck. I haven't made any decisions yet. I've been forced to do all of the things that I've done so far. Um, and the piece over on the right there is touching both a red and a blue. So it's going to have to be yellow. But that's also true of the other three remaining pieces as well. And they're also now connected to a yellow piece. So it's not possible. And I, I imagine some of you will have come to some kind of conclusion along these lines. Um, there is another way to prove this that I think is really quite nice. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, so in the middle there, we had uh, a piece with four pieces connected around it in a, in a loop. And you can do that. You can alternate colors around that loop. But if I had a different number of colors, if I had, say, five uh, pieces around that loop, I couldn't do it with two colors because I couldn't alternate and end up with them not all connected. So if instead of thinking of that as the middle, I think of this as the middle, if you can count the number of pieces around that that are all connected to each other, there are five. So if I want to try my alternating trick around here, I'm going to end up getting stuck because I'm going to end up with two pieces the same color together. And in fact, if you are ever presented with a problem along these lines, you know, if you've only brought three different colors of crayons with you, you may, you may find yourself in this situation, uh, and you need to color something in. If you can find a structure like this, where you have a section that has an odd number of pieces around it that are all connected together in a loop, then it is not possible. And that is one of the things that mathematicians have proved and found about this type of problem, is that as soon as you find that type of structure anywhere in the thing, the whole thing is not possible. So that's an example of the kind of reasoning you can use to solve this problem. Uh, but I guess the big problem remains. Is there a maximum number of colors you might need to color something in? And if so, what is it? And the piece of maths that was proved in the 1970s was called the four color theorem. And there is a clue in the name uh, as to what the theorem actually says. Mathematicians quite often name things just, yeah, just what it is. Uh, so the four color theorem says that for any map you can draw on a flat piece of paper, you will never need more than four colors to color it in. And I think that's really lovely. It's not just a piece of maths. It's a fact about the universe. It's not possible to construct a map on a flat piece of paper that needs more than four colors. Um, some need fewer than four, some need exactly four, but nothing will ever need more than four. Uh, and the map makers were very relieved because obviously uh, they've been dead for 50 years. Um, but <laughs> you know, they, didn't, they didn't need to buy a fifth color of ink, basically. They could do everything with four colors. And it was a really nice example of a proof as well, which made use of computer technology. Because in the 1970s, computers were quite new. Um, and essentially, the, the way that the proof worked was that they'd taken uh, a set of smaller sections of map. They basically worked out a whole set of pieces of map, and they said, uh, any map that you can construct can be made up using these smaller pieces. And that in itself was probably the most difficult step, was to prove that the pieces that they'd chosen were enough to be able to construct any possible map. Uh, and then all they simply had to do was work out that each of those could then be colored with four colors. And if you connect them together in different ways, you could still color it with four colors. Um, so they simply had to check several thousand things, uh, which is a lot of things to check. Uh, and to do it by hand would have taken a very, very long time. So they put all of the information that they had into a computer and got it to check through all the cases. And the computer confirmed that it was possible. Uh, so it's quite nice that they actually began the process of using computers to prove things in mathematics, which is now obviously a much more established thing. Uh, but that was one of the first times that that was ever used. And um, it was in the early 1970s that they did this proof. And uh, in, I think it was around about 1973, this diagram appeared in a journal called Scientific American. And the caption of this diagram was, a map requiring five colors. And that's a bit worrying. Um, mathematicians all over the world got their crayons out, started to try and color this in. This is definitely possible. We've proved it. It's definitely possible. Got a bit stuck. Couldn't do it. 
got slightly more worried. Uh, but then they realised that it was published on the 1st of April, 1973, uh, by a person called Martin Gardner, who was uh, a writer who was very interested in maths, and they had a regular maths column in uh, Scientific American, where they published mathematical games and diversions and toys and amusements. And this was an April Fool's gag. So uh, in fact, it is possible, because everything is possible with four colors. Uh, it's just really difficult. And if you would like a copy of this, I will put my email address up at the end. I can email you uh, a copy of this, because it's quite a nice challenge for a rainy day, if you can imagine what such a thing might be like. Um, you, can, uh, you can have a sit and try and color this in. And the PDF I'll send you has two copies on a sheet, because you will definitely get it wrong the first time. Um, and then you can try again on the other one. Um, but anyway, the kind of maths that they used to solve this problem uh, was a kind of maths called graph theory, which is a really, really nice bit of pure maths. Um, and essentially what you do is this diagram contains a lot more information than we actually need. So the shapes of the pieces and the sizes of the pieces are probably irrelevant to the question because it only really matters how they connect together. So what you do is you give each of those pieces uh, a point that represents that piece. And then if the two pieces share an edge, you can connect them with a line. And this will give you a graph or a network uh, which will represent that diagram, basically. And then this is the object that you do your maths on. And you can write down the structure of this graph much more easily in numbers because you don't need all of that extra information. Uh, and graph theory is one of my favorite kinds of maths. Uh, I have no idea why I didn't do it for my PhD. Uh, other maths is also interesting. Uh, but the graph theory, to me, at, at A level, when I started learning about graph theory at A level, that was one of my favorite bits. Uh, and I love the fact that we've got all of these nice, so you can see that structure there where you've got a piece in the middle connected to five pieces that are all connected together with a loop around the outside. That's the thing that makes this not possible. Uh, and all of that kind of stuff is studied by people who do graph theory. Um, but you know, I've promised you unsolved puzzles, haven't I? I promised you open questions, so I'm going to get onto some of those. Uh, but first, I'm going to give you another puzzle. Uh, so I'm going to put it on the screen, give you a minute to think about it, and then come back. The question is, what's the smallest number which has all of the numbers 1 to 9 as a factor? So that it's divisible by all of the numbers from 1 to 9. One minute, have a go. OK. OK, so for this one, I think if, I've, if we can get hands up with answers, does anyone have an answer to this? There's a hand right at the back. Yeah. 1,260. I'm going to say that is not the answer, because I know that there is something that is not divisible by, but I can't work it out off the top of my head, because uh, the answer is bigger than that. So there is, it's not divisible by 8. That seems plausible. Yes, it's not divisible by 8. OK, does anyone have a different answer? Over on the left, yeah. 2,520, anyone else get that? OK, we've got a bunch of hands up for that. So there are a few different ways to work this out. Uh, but essentially, you need to make sure that it has enough factors to be divisible by everything. And you could, for instance, take the product of all the numbers 1 to 9. If you do 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 times 9, you will get 362,880, which is 9 factorial. Uh, that is definitely divisible but it is very much not the smallest number that is divisible. But if you look at that number and that list of factors, you realize that some of them aren't necessary. Because if it's divisible by 8, then it's already divisible by 4. It's divisible by 2 as well. Um, and if it's divisible by 6, then it's already divisible by 3 and by 2. So you can kind of cross out some of them. And the only ones that you need to leave in are the prime factors and enough 2s, essentially. <laughs> so you end up with 5, 7, and um, a couple of threes and three twos. So five, seven, eight, and nine. And if you multiply those all together, you'll get 2,520. Uh, I think that's quite a nice little problem. I like that. OK, so sticking with the theme of numbers, uh, I wanted to share one of my favorite unsolved problems. And this is a question which we genuinely don't know the answer to. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I haven't checked the news this morning. Uh, this is always the problem with this talk. If someone actually proves any of these, that's just a whole chunk of this talk gone. Um, so this is a, I guess it's kind of a game. It's kind of a number-based game. And uh, you start, you pick your number, 
And I imagine that because of uh, the people I have in the room here, I'm going to have to specify a positive whole number. So those of you with your minus pies, all right. Um, a positive whole number. And if your number is even, you're going to divide it by two, because you can. Just cut that whole thing straight in half. And if your number is odd, instead of dividing by two, you will multiply by three and add one. And don't ask me why these are particular rules for this game, uh, but if you put a number into this, you will hopefully, if you've done it correctly, get out another positive whole number, which you can then put back in, and that will give you a different number. You can take that and put it back in and get a different number, and you can continue kind of chasing a number around and see what happens when you do this. So for example, uh, if I start with a number like 16, uh, 16 is even, so I'm gonna divide it by two and get eight. That's even, so I get four, that's also even. So I'll go to two, that is even as well, so I'll go to one. That is an odd number, so I'll go to four, and then two, and then one, and then four, and then two, and then one, and I'm kind of stuck. I'm kind of trapped in a little loop of four, two, and one for the rest of time. So in this game, if I ever reach one, I'm gonna stop. That is where I give up, I have lost, I'm out. So maybe 16 is not the best place to start, let's try somewhere else. So if I start from, say, 12, 12 is a different number, Maybe something different will happen. So 12 is even, so I divide by two and get six. That's even, so three. That is odd, so I go to 10, even, five, odd, 16. Oh, and we know what happens to 16. You go crashing all the way down to one. So it kind of, you know, as soon as you reach a number that you already know what happens, you, you can kind of follow on from there. And what's interesting about this is that I could have picked any two rules up here. Um, I could have picked uh, a different thing to happen if it's even and a different thing to happen if it's odd, you know, divide by two, multiply by 17. Uh, or I could have picked three different categories instead of even and odd. I could have had a different, uh, different set of ways to divide up the numbers. Um, but if I take this particular set of rules and I put in any of these numbers, I will end up at one. I will very quickly, within a few steps, end up either at one or somewhere on one of these two that we've already seen and definitely on the way to one. If I start from 27, I will also end up at one, but it will go via 9,232 and it will take 111 steps to get there, but it will eventually get to one. And what's interesting about these particular rules is that instead of having kind of a little loop somewhere that some numbers get caught in and a different loop off somewhere else that some other numbers get caught in, or maybe some numbers go and keep getting bigger forever, or maybe there's some numbers that if you, uh, if you get to a particular place, it just stays at that same place forever. It looks like for every number you try, you will end up at one. There is a kind of black hole of numbers that these particular rules guide you towards, and you always end up stuck at one. And it, I say it looks like because we don't actually know. So there's a piece of maths called the Colatz conjecture, which was named after the mathematician that conjectured it. And the conjecture says that for any number you start from, you will end up at one in a finite number of steps. And of course, your first instinct, if you're trying to solve or prove a thing like this, is to try some numbers, try some different things. So we've tried up to about two to the 60, which is a lot of numbers. Uh, it's billions and billions of numbers, uh, and they all seem to work. But that doesn't prove the conjecture. Um, and in fact, to prove it that way, to prove it by checking every number, uh, would take literally forever. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it literally took forever. Um, you, can always, you can always pick them up on that because you can say, I think you'll find that's not correct. In this case, this is a legitimate use of that statement. It would literally take forever to check every single number. So you can't do that. That is not a way to prove this conjecture. Uh, so you would have to use you know, maybe some properties of these rules and some properties of numbers that you know uh, to kind of, maybe you could rule out categories of numbers and say, well, all of these numbers definitely work. Um, but no one has managed to prove that this will always work for any number. But nor has anyone managed to find a number that this doesn't work for. So there could be some huge number out there somewhere that we haven't discovered yet that is a counterexample to this conjecture, and we just don't know. And even though it's such a simple statement, a simple question, we don't know the answer to this. So I think that's kind of interesting. OK, I'm going to give you another puzzle. Uh, this time it is a puzzle which involves an imaginary piece of A4 paper. And I hope you've brought yours with you. Here is mine. Um, if you can imagine a piece of A4 paper. I realize that there are quite a few pieces of A4 paper around in the room. Please resist the urge to pick them up. Just leave them where they are. And just use your imaginary one. If it helps you to imagine one, here's a picture. 
There you go. So just imagine a piece of A4 paper. If I see anyone or hear anyone rustling a real piece of A4 paper, I would look at you in an angry way. That's all I've got. OK, so the puzzle is, I'm going to put the, the puzzle up on the screen. I've got a little animation to show you exactly what I mean, clarify, and then you'll have a minute to think about this one. So the question is, if you fold an A4 piece of paper in half three times, always folding the long edge in half, so whichever edge is longer, you fold it so that that edge gets folded in half. Then cut all four corners off. How many holes will you make in the paper? So I'll show you what I mean by that. So the first fold is going to be this way, because that is the long edge up the left-hand side. Now the long edge is the other way, so the second fold is like this. And then the long edge is vertical again, so we fold it this way. And then you want to cut all four corners off that, like that. And if I unfolded that piece of paper, how many holes would be in it. So just imaginary paper only, please. One minute, have a go. OK, I just I love watching people solve that. <laughs> you see lots of kind of imaginary, just imagining a piece of paper. And then occasionally you get the actual like hands being bits of paper. Uh, and then you also get people who just do this. And you can just see them imagining, and it's great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to unfold this piece of paper that is pictured on the screen. And hopefully, if you have an answer, you can confirm uh, whether or not it is correct. So the first unfolding is going to be this. If I unfold the second fold, I will get this. And if I unfold the third fold, I will get this. So if you thought three, that is correct. If you thought more than three, you may have counted some of the uh, notches in the edges as holes. They are not holes. Um, once when I asked this question, someone put their hand up and said, when you say hole, what do you mean by a hole? And I said, a hole. And they said, OK, fine. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so there are three holes in this paper. And in fact, this is part of a sequence of puzzles. Uh, so this was uh, a, sequen a puzzle that I found. Um, a friend of mine is on a mailing list, uh, which is the mailing list for the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the best website. Uh, it is literally an online encyclopedia of sequences of integers. And it has a mailing list called Sequence Fans. And on this mailing list, someone shared this problem, which was, if you fold a piece of paper in half n times, always folding the long edge in half, how many holes will you make? And it creates a sequence of answers. So if you can solve this case, you can work out a general formula. It's lovely. Uh, but I love making people do that without recourse to an actual piece of paper, because it's such a nice, uh, fiddly problem to try and solve in your mind. OK, so I wanted to share another um, unsolved piece of maths. Um, and this is relating to a piece of maths which uh, has already been mentioned, but not by me, uh, which is Pythagoras' theorem. So I, I also mentioned it, I guess. But it was originally mentioned by someone at the back of the room. Uh, and Pythagoras' theorem is great. I, I use it all the time. You use it all the time. I literally used it the other day. We have a wardrobe that's as tall as the room, uh, and we couldn't, like, we couldn't stand it up. We had to build it stood up. But we literally checked beforehand how much clearance would there be and worked out whether we could build it lying down and then stand it up. And the answer was no, and Pythagoras' theorem helped. Uh, anyway, if you've got Pythagoras' theorem and you've got a right angle triangle that you know the length of two of the sides of, you can use it to calculate the third side. And uh, in this case, it's five. Uh, does anyone know this one? Shout it out. The, everyone knows this one. Good, that's terrifying. So this is always memorize the first two because then people will think you know them all. Um, and these are both simple examples of triangles where all three of those sides are integers. They're all whole numbers. 
Um, and even if they're not, even if the third side is not a nice, well-behaved whole number, Pythagoras' theorem will still get you that third side. But if you are just interested in the case where all of those three sides are whole numbers, if you're just integerested, sorry, what you can do uh, is you can add an extra layer to this as a puzzle. So I'm going to put, first of all, I'm going to make those triangles into rectangles. And now Pythagoras' theorem is telling me the diagonal of the rectangle. Instead of it being the third side of a triangle, it's exactly the same formula uh, for the diagonal. But if I now kick that rectangle up into 3D, I will get a cuboid. And a cuboid has got three different faces. So I guess the pairs of faces opposite are the same as each other, but there are three different types of face on this cuboid, and each of them has a diagonal. It's sometimes called the face diagonal of the cuboid. And in fact, if you know what the lengths of A, B, and C are, you can use different combinations of them with Pythagoras' okay. theorem to work out the lengths of D, E, and F. And if you would like all of those six numbers to be an integer, then this is a very nice constrained little problem. Uh, and you get something which is called an Euler brick. And Euler was a Swiss mathematician who had lots and lots of uh, pieces of maths named after him. Um, I genuinely don't know. There's so many things named after Euler. I genuinely don't know if this is something that Euler actually worked on or if someone just went, you know who's great? <laughs> Let's just call this after Euler. Uh, so this is called an Euler brick. And if it helps, I have a picture of Euler and I've photoshopped in a brick. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Um, but that is what this is called anyway. So you can have, uh, there, are, there are various ones of these you can find. So here is an example. If these are your three side lengths, uh, the diagonals will all be integers. Uh, and it's very nice and lovely. And in, in, in fact, there are infinitely many of these. So this is something that we know quite a lot of examples of. And in fact, once you've got one, you can just get eight of them and put them together and make a bigger cuboid that also has all integer diagonals. So there are infinitely many in their own families. Um, but it's quite a nice little challenge to try and find one. You know, maybe... Uh, write a little computer program, or in, I mean, my favorite method would be make a spreadsheet because I love spreadsheets, uh, or just hardcore, just get a pen and paper, don't even use a calculator, just go for it. Uh, but it is a nice little challenge to try and find an example of an Euler brick. Um, but I can actually make this harder. I can make this into a more constrained problem. So if in my cuboid, I would also like this diagonal to be an integer as well. So this is the kind of 3D diagonal from the top front left corner to the bottom back right corner. It's sometimes called the space diagonal, which does sound like a ride at Disneyland. Um, they just they won't answer any of my emails. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, so the space diagonal is this kind of 3D diagonal. And if you want that to be an integer as well, then this is what's known as a perfect cuboid. There is no known example of a perfect cuboid. No one has ever found one. Nor has anyone managed to prove that it's not possible to construct one. Um, I think, they've again, they've checked a lot of cases. So if one does exist, the shortest side is at least a billion. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, they also know various things about the relative, uh, the, the numbers modulo various different things, so uh, if whether they're odd or even and things like that. Um, but we don't actually know if one exists. And people are working on this. I know there is at least one guy in the Netherlands who's got a computer crunching numbers and checking cases. Um, but in fact, we don't know. And I kind of wish that someone would prove uh, that it's not possible, because I feel like it's a useful thing to know. It's a bit of, nice bit of life advice. You know, uh, if you're feeling a bit down, don't worry. There's no such thing as a perfect cuboid. Like, it's, it's just good. It's nice. It makes you feel better. Um, but who knows? There might be one. It might be out there. We might have just not found it yet. And even though this is, again, very simple, this is school-level maths that people all learn, um, we can't actually solve this problem. OK. So I have another puzzle for you. Oh, yeah, this is a great one. OK. So this is a, a coin-related puzzle. If you have coins, if you're familiar with coins, uh, you will hopefully uh, be able to do this one. And I'm going to put uh, an example up first, rather than just go straight into the puzzle. So my example is this. If I have three 20p coins, this is not just me showing off. Uh, <laughs> check me out. I've got three 20p coins. Um, I can't pay 50p. If the person I'm paying is not prepared to give me change, I cannot give them 50p, uh, even though I have more than 50p. So it's a frustrating situation for everyone. Why do they not give change? But anyway, uh, this is the, the example that I hope will give you a bit of an insight into what I'm trying to ask here. So the question is, what's the largest amount of money you can have in change so that you can't pay one pound or any multiple of one pound exactly? And I guess the clue there is that the answer is more than a pound. So have a minute to think about it.
Okay. Okay, so I'm hoping some of you have answers to this one. In the interest of brevity, I'm just going to explain uh, one way to solve this problem. Uh, so if you think about the largest coins you might have, I've had to specifically exclude the case of multiples of a pound because of the invention of the two pound coin, which ruined this puzzle and made me have to add an extra sentence in there. Uh, but you can't have any multiples of a pound either. So two pound coins are out. Pound coins are definitely way out. But you could have a 50p but you could not have more than one 50p because that would make a pound. So 50p is definitely in there. Um, but then if you've got a 50p, you could have some 20ps. And in fact, if you think about how many 20ps you can actually legitimately have, you can have as many as four and still not be able to create a pound using any combination of those coins. So that's, that's quite a lot of 20ps, but you can't have five because that would be a pound. And the next coin is 10ps, but if I add a 10p at this stage, then I can just go 50, 20, 20, 10, and I've got a pound, so I can't have any 10 Ps at all, uh, but I can have a 5 P. And in fact, I can do the same kind of thing that I've done up here, uh, down here with smaller coins. So I can have one 5 P, and then similarly up to four 2 Ps, and still not be able to make 10 P with any of these coins down here. So the total, in fact, that you can have is one pound 43 and still not be able to pay a pound. And in fact, this is a lovely puzzle because this is not a puzzle that I found in a book of math puzzles or anything like that. This is just something that happened to a friend of mine. So I have a friend who's a mathematician and at the time she was based in Edinburgh and in Edinburgh, they don't give change on the buses. You have to have the exact money or else you just have to give them more money than you're actually required to pay. Uh, and she got on the bus and the fare was a pound and she didn't quite have the right money to make a pound, and she had to pay slightly over a pound. She was very angry about this. Um, and when she got sat down on the bus, because she was a mathematician, she was like, right, what's the most angry I could be right now? Uh, <laughs> and the answer, it turns out, is one pound 43. OK, so I've just realized that I'm uh, slightly longer than I was meaning to talk for, but I wanted to finish with one more uh, open maths problem, which I'm sure you will enjoy. Uh, so if I'm eating slightly into the q and I apologize. Uh, but this is a maths problem relating to a very important and serious topic, which is pancakes. Um, so this is something that I discovered recently. So this is a picture of some pancakes which are clearly made by someone who is cheating because they're all exactly the same size. I can't do this. Whenever I make pancakes, they're all wildly differing sizes. Uh, but I console myself by serving them in size order. <laughs> so I stack them up so that the smallest one is on top and they get bigger as you go down. And this is obviously the best way to serve pancakes. Uh, but in fact, I've brought a prop, so I'll show you. Um, so this is uh, a tray of uh, prop pancakes, which I'm holding in one hand. And the theory behind this particular bit of maths is that if you're holding your pancakes in one hand and you have a flipper in the other hand, uh, there isn't much you can do to change the order of the pancakes. So I couldn't, say, extract one specific pancake and move it to somewhere else in the stack. Um, all I can really do is take the top section of the pancake stack and flip it. Uh, and that is the, the kind of the move that I'm allowed to do in this. So if I now take this bit and flip it as well, I've effectively just moved uh, the top pancake down a little bit in the stack. So I can combine these moves in different ways to move the pancakes around however I want to. So... Uh, what I need to do uh, is the thing that mathematicians are interested in, uh, in terms of these pancakes, is a thing called the pancake number. Uh, and genuinely, that's what it's called. Uh, so if you have a stack like this, I'll put the numbers on them here. Um, if I want to solve this stack of pancakes and get it back into the right order, uh, I could start off by putting my flipper in underneath pancake four, like this. Uh, and then I could put my flipper in under pancake three and flip that whole section. And then my third flip would be crea creating a, a sorted stack of pancakes. Ah, we can all relax. So this is uh, three flips. But the question that they want to ask is, what is the minimum number of flips that you need? Like, if you've got a particular stack of pancakes, how many flips does it take to sort that stack of pancakes? And in fact, for a given size of pancake stack, what is the maximum that that number can be? So it's one of those quantities that's the maximum of the minimums. It's a very slightly confusing quantity. So if you have three pancakes, for instance, there are six different ways uh, that you can stack them. And for each of these, you can work out the minimum number of flips. So obviously, I could take more than this if I wanted to. But at a minimum, that one is already sorted, needs no flips. This one can be done in one. This can be done in one. These both take two. And that one cannot be done in fewer than three flips. You can try, but it can't. So for three pancakes, the pancake number is the maximum 
of all of these. It's the worst case scenario. It's the most awkward size stack of pancakes. Uh, so in this case, it's three. So for three pancakes, the pancake number is three. For four pancakes, it's four. For five pancakes, it is five. Those of you who are fans of patterns, no. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't carry on like that. That would be the most boring piece of maths. Um, but it does increase. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to the fact that for five pancakes, it is five flips. And the reason for that is that I have five pancakes in this stack. Uh, so what I might do is if I can just carefully step down here, if I could ask uh, you, could you please disorder the pancakes for me? Just put them in any order you like. Um, and while you do that, um, I'm going to explain why I'm talking about this, because these are, these are known mathematical facts. But interestingly, for 20 pancakes, we don't know what the pancake number is. So this is an open problem. People work on this. Um, and it sounds ridiculous, but this is actually a really nice piece of math with applications in computer science. Um, so the, the type of algorithm that we're using here is called a prefix reversal algorithm, because you take the first bit and you reverse it. Uh, and it is a type of algorithm that is sometimes used to sort things in computer science. So if you can understand these algorithms, then you can use that in various different places. And for 20 pancakes, it's just a huge problem. There's just so many possible combinations uh, that to even compute them all and check them with a computer would just take unfeasibly long at the current state of computing. So options include find a cleverer way to work out the answer, build a bigger computer. I'm pretty sure people are working on both. Uh, so eventually we will get there, but this is currently still an unknown thing. Um, and I guess, so the, the examples of problems that I've given in this talk have been quite simple deliberately so that uh, I can explain some of the maths behind them. But obviously there are more complicated questions out there. There are big questions like the Clay Millennium Maths Prizes, uh, with each of which has a million dollar prize. So you can, uh, in theory, win some money for doing some maths. Uh, and people who do research in maths all the time have you know, lifetimes of work ahead of them. And it's, it's just a fantastic subject. Um, but I guess the thing to bear in mind is that these puzzles will not be unsolved forever. And if they do get solved, it will be by someone who, when they see a puzzle, uh, they're not prepared to give up. And they will keep going until they get an answer. And I'm acutely aware that I have a puzzle remaining to solve, which I will do uh, shortly. And I'm going to put my uh, final slide up here. It's got my email address. So if you want to get in touch with me, uh, if you've got any questions about any of this stuff or any other bits of maths, uh, please feel free. I can also answer some questions now in the Q&A, but I'm first going to try and do that in five or fewer flips, uh, because mathematics says it's possible. So if I can't do this, um, I don't know. If I can do this, a, a large round of applause would be a great way to finish. Um, and if I fail to do it in five, uh, pff, I don't know, just sympathy applause? I don't know. OK, so f I'm going to say my first flip is to flip the whole thing. This is kind of a physical puzzle and a mental puzzle in one. Uh, OK, so flip one. OK. Uh, OK, and I'm going to say, OK, flip number two. I'm going to flip these. OK, my third flip. I might actually do this. No, I'm not going to do this in four, but I will do it in five. So my third flip is going to be this. OK, and oh, no, I think I can do this in four. OK, so then this hopefully should restore the whole thing to the right way up. And you can all go wild with applause. Uh, and then we'll go to Q&A. Here we go. Right, well, thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Pancake flipping, great. So have we got the microphones ready? So the, um, you were talking about the uh, four color theorem, and that was on a flat piece of paper. What if you want to color a globe? OK, well, I was very careful to continue to stay on a flat piece of paper because the four color theorem works slightly differently on different shapes. So topology, which is the area of maths that I did a, a research in, uh, is the kind of the, the, the maths of shapes and the way that things connect together. Um, so on a flat piece of paper, four colors is the maximum you'll need. On the surface of a sphere, it's still four. And that's because there is a sense in which a surface of a sphere and a piece of paper have a lot of things in common. Uh, and the way that you can imagine it is that if you take a sphere and remove a single point from it, um, in terms of a coloring, that point could be in the middle of one of your regions, so it doesn't really make any difference. And if you then stretch that out and make it flat, the region that is round the outside is the one region that was the one that you took the point out of. So a sphere and a flat piece of paper are the same 
in terms of colouring problems and in terms of various other topological properties. Um, the thing that differs is if you add a hole, uh, by which I mean something like a torus, like a donut with a hole through the middle. Um, so on the surface of a torus, I'm going to remember these the wrong way around now, uh, but it's something like six or seven colours. Uh, is possible. Someone in the audience is putting up seven fingers, I trust him implicitly. So it's seven <laughs> colours on the surface of a torus, but you can also do it on other shapes as well. So if you're familiar with the Mobius band, which is a, a strip of paper that you put a twist in and join it together, on a Mobius band it's six. No one in the audience is frantically holding up any other number of fingers, so I'm going to go with that. Um, so you can actually divide it up into six regions that connect. Um, and in fact, the thing about the mug is really nice. Be sorry, about the torus is really nice. I can't tell the difference. I'm a topologist. Uh, a torus is equivalent to a mug. So if you have a mug with a handle that's plain white, you can get marker pens and draw it and divide it up into seven regions, all of which connect to all the other seven regions, because the handle of the mug gives you the same structure as a hole in a torus. Uh, so you can actually physically do that for yourself and colour it in and see it working. Uh, so that's quite nice. I think there are some, uh, web, some maths websites that sell mugs that have seven colours on them in the, in the kind of pattern, so they all connect together. So uh, it's, yeah. But it, it does change depending on the properties of the surface. It is a good point. I, I dodged around it quite carefully and kept, kept saying on, this, on a flat piece of paper. But it is four for a map for a flat piece of paper. Sorry. Um, in terms of, again, the four colour theorem, um, obviously it being proved by a computer kind of exhaustively, do you think that that changes the nature of proof in comparison to kind of the traditional methods, which maybe are like more eloquent, I guess, or... Yeah, it, it, it was a big deal at the time. So a lot of people were very dubious about this. And they said, you know, this isn't really a proof, is it? We haven't checked this by hand. Uh, and there were some people, you know, computers do errors. This is a thing I've heard. Because it was so new. Computers were so new at the time. Um, and since then, they have done other proofs of the four-color theorem. So they've reduced the size of the number of things you need to check and then done them by hand. Um, and there are other, other kinds of proofs for it as well. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the first step into a new way of proving things. So once you've got the power of computers to check things, it, it changes the game totally. And it's, it's just kind of, I guess, the next stage in development. So uh, my other half is a finite group theorist. And his research was basically uh, using a computer to manipulate this gigantic object consisting of billions of things uh, that are all connected together in particular ways. And he was trying to study this object and work out what was going on with it. And there was no way you could do that without a computer. You just couldn't even conceive of an object that big. Um, but he could manipulate it, and he could ask the computer questions about it and interrogate the structure and work out what it looks like. Uh, and that was his PhD. So I feel like without computers, we'd be a lot further back in maths. But at the same time, yeah, you do have to be careful because, yes, computers do errors, but then so do people. So all of the systems that we've got in place to check that a human proof is correct all need to still be applied to computer proofs as well. And I don't really know how you do that if only the computer can even understand the thing involved. So it's a big question. It's a good question. Hi, Katie. You, you mentioned that uh, we should be quick and, and solve problems because other people will come along and have a go. <laughs> um, is, is it not the case, though, that some problems will never be solved? Well, there are, so there are, this is one of the really lovely things about maths, is that it is possible to prove that it is not possible to prove something. Yeah. Uh, so there exist certain problems which it has been proved we will never know one way or the other whether it is one thing or another thing. Uh, and it's just, oh, come on. <laughs> um, but I think that is part of the beauty of it as well. So I guess the, the answer to a problem being we will never know the answer to this problem is an answer in some sense and should satisfy you. But that, there's one thing that's nice about maths, a lot of people appreciate this about maths at school, is it is possible to get the right answer and know you've got the right answer. So solving a problem is satisfying for that reason. Um, and if the resolution is, oh, we don't know and we'll never know, um, you'd hope that that will give you the same kind of satisfaction, but it probably realistically doesn't. But what it actually does, so there's, there, are, there are undecidable problems that it's been proven we'll never know what the actual answer is. Um, and people just go, OK, well, I'm going to assume it's this, and you assume it's this, and we'll both just do some new maths. And they've just branched maths into two halves, and they're researching both halves and imagining that this thing is true and imagining it's false, and just creating two totally separate bits of maths. Um, and there's kind of logic conferences where people meet up, and they're like, are you zon yes or zon no? And you have to kind of work out which kind of maths you're doing before you can actually have a conversation about it. Um, so I, th I think it's, yeah. It's part of the whole thing is that there will sometimes be unanswerable questions, but at least we'll know they're unanswerable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the four color problem, um, I don't see you know, co uh, um, you know, the, the, the computer um, simulations as a, 
as a solution to the problem. I want to see a mathematical proof, you know, and that, that, that's a real proof. I mean, if you use a computer to, you know, go through all the, all the possible, that, that's not a proof for me. So, so it's not a mathematical proof. So you're saying you don't think computer proofs are valid proofs? No, they are not valid. I mean, it needs to be done by a person. No, but I mean, it, if, it if has to be done mathematically, you know, to prove I mean, if, well, for, for it to be a, pro, uh, you know, a mathematical proof. Yeah, I, I guess if the content of the proof is that you've literally gone through thousands and thousands of things and checked them all, I wouldn't guarantee that a person would do that infallibly either. Um, and I think that computers helped by people can achieve a lot more. You know, people, people using computers as a tool can achieve a lot more than people sat working things out by hand. So, for example, calculation of digits of pi. If you look at the history of the number of digits of pi that we know, um, it, it starts small and it gets bigger and people kind of discover new, you know, they work out better ways to calculate pi and they discover more and more digits. And if you look at the graph of how many digits of pi we know, as soon as a computer is invented, it's just up. It just goes straight off because as soon as you've got that calculation potential, you can then just calculate, you know, incredibly large numbers of things. And we now have uh, something like 10 trillion digits of pi uh, that we know as a, as a species, we understand pi that well. Um, and without computers, we couldn't do any of that. But I think it is definitely true that if something is happening inside a closed box and you can't see everything that's going on, you sh you're right to be wary that that is not necessarily doing the thing that you think it's doing. But I think making use of computers, certainly when it's just checking a lot of laborious cases, um, will speed things up and will help. Um, but you maybe need several different people to write different computer programs and make sure that they all get the same result or something like that to make sure that um, you can trust it a bit more. I guess. I mean, it's also totally valid to have the opinion that computer proofs don't count. Um, but the, as I say, they have since done a different type of proof that also proves it, but without relying so heavily on computers. So that, if, if that helps you, uh, you can. I mean, you can look up the proof of the four color theorem and there's a whole history behind it, but it was a real kind of turning point. It was a real moment in history when we started using computers to prove things. So 